is part of a series I do recommend watching last week's video. Check out the uh, annotations on the screen for a full playlist or search my site. Um, and we're just talking about transferring images from cameras. And what kind of got me on this topic was I bought one of these cameras. This is a uh, Theta made by Rico. And a year and a half ago, when it first came out, it was like four or five hundred dollars. It's now down to like two fifty to three hundred, depending on where you buy it. And it's still way overpriced. I'm still debating on returning mine. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'm probably going to be returning it, mainly because the image quality is rather horrible on it. So what what is this camera? It's this little pocket size camera, and on both sides, it's got a fisheye lens. It's got a button on it, you press it, it takes a 360 sphere. It's not just a panorama, it's a sphere image. Uh, just like you would do, you could do with your cell phone by taking like 20 pictures, it's one click and it's done. Then you can upload them to your website to view them like this. So you can look all around. Now, it's pretty cool. There's a seam right where your hand is holding it and your hand is also a big portion of the image when you do this. So it only has uh, three buttons on it. Power, to turn on the Wi-Fi, because that's how you connect to it, and the button to take a picture. It does video as well. I haven't even tried taking video with it. I just was so unpleased with the image quality. So let, let me make this full screen. You can kind of see. I mean, this is a bright, outside, sunny day, and it's fairly grainy on these faces that are pretty close up. It's a neat little toy. Um, if they ever get down to about $100, I'd say they're worth it. Anything over $100, I don't think this camera is worth it. Um, next week, I'll probably go over showing you how to simply write your own application to view them as a sphere like this so you don't have to use their proprietary software on their site. What happens if someday their site disappears? And uh, But today, we're going to start looking at options to replace their app, and then we'll go over that. So, like I said, there's a button on it to take a picture, but you end up getting a lot of your hand in the picture. So the ideal way is to install their app on your phone or tablet. They have them for Android and iPhone. Um, and then you can take pictures remotely with that. A uh, few issues with that, and I don't want to get into too much detail. I want this video to be too long. Basically, you connect to it like it's a Wi-Fi hotspot. Once you connect to it, you no longer have internet access because you're using it and it doesn't have any internet. So you connect your phone to it, and then you install, well, you install the app first, then you connect to it, and then you can take pictures with it. And you have a few options with the app. You can adjust the, the um, aperture, not the app, yeah, the aperture. I haven't played, I've set it on auto most for the most part. Uh, you can adjust the brightness and contrast a little bit. I did that because the pictures were looking kind of dark. And you can set it so it takes pictures in intervals, like every three seconds or five seconds. It doesn't even have like a timer, like if you wanna, put it on a tripod and go take a picture of yourself somewhere. As far as I can tell with their app, you can set it to take a picture every three seconds and then it takes a bunch of pictures and you pick the one you like. I'd like for it to be able to wait five seconds or 10 seconds to take a picture. So I ended up writing my own stuff, actually using other people's stuff and then making a, a front end for it for my phone. So today we're gonna look at the back end of that one of a few options. So not so much talking about the camera anymore. Let's get into the software. Last week we were looking at G Photo 2. So right here I'm in a shell and I'm actually hooked up. This uh, shell is in a Debian Cheroot on my phone. You can do the same thing on your desktop. That's another issue with their app. If you want to take pictures using a laptop or your desktop, um, there's no option for that uh, with their software. But G Photo 2 will do what's called, last week we looked at PTP, which is a Photo Transfer Protocol. This week, we're look, this week we're looking at PTP IP, which is basically the same thing, but through a network, which a lot of cameras nowadays uh, come with Wi-Fi capabilities. So this is an important thing to learn if you ever want to use those functionalities and avoid the proprietary software. So again, Right now, the shell you're looking at is on my uh, Motorola G cell phone, uh, but I'm running inside a Debian Cheroot, so you can do this on any Debian device. Um, so I just hooked to the camera through Wi-Fi. Again, even using their app, it's very touchy. Uh, your phone's gonna wanna connect to other Wi-Fi stuff, losing your connection, and I've played around with the app just to see if it was any better than what I was doing because I was getting iffy results with the scripts I was writing and it turns out their app is just as iffy. You'd be taking pictures all of a sudden, it can't take pictures anymore. You gotta turn the camera off, turn it back on, reconnect to the Wi-Fi. So I'm 
uh, just telling you this because I'm probably going to run into this. So I'm not really talking up this camera too well, but I thought it was important if you have one or maybe the price comes down and you buy one or you have some other camera similar to it, um, you're going to want to know how to access it. So uh, again, since I'm running in a, this bottom, the bottom part of the screen here is on my Android device. Uh, and if I start typing, you'll see that after a little bit, the line starts overlapping. That happens when you're logged into a shell on a cell phone like this. So just to not get that and see things clearer, I type things up here and I'm going to copy and paste them down there. So I'm creating a function here. You can just run this command, but putting into a function or putting into a script allows you just to call that function. So I'm creating a function called Theta, again, the name of the phone, and I'm using uh, GPhoto2, which I installed using apt-get on my phone. Um, so I'm using the port here. And the last time we used the port command and the camera command, or at least we looked at the port command. Um, when you con connect to the uh, Rico Theta, uh, you get an IP address of 192.168.1.5. And if you try to connect more than one device, it doesn't, it seems to stop handing out IP addresses after that. Um, but the camera itself, just like a router would be, is 192.168.1.1. So what we're doing here is I'm going to take this function, and if you watch last week's video, you should pretty much understand it. We're saying gphoto2 connect to this IP address, this is what the camera is, and then trigger capture will take a picture. Now that I've run down here, if my phone is still connected to it through Wi-Fi, which it appears to be, I can just type theta and hit enter, and the camera just took a picture. So I'll hold the camera closer to my microphone because the camera makes a cute little chirping noise when you take a picture. So, so there you go. We're taking pictures here. So it is working. If for some reason you try to run this command, turn off the camera, turn it back on, reconnect to it through Wi-Fi, which sometimes takes two or three tries, and then try again. So, and again, if I say I have config, you can see on my Wi-Fi here I am. Uh, I told you, it seems to always hand out .5 as your IP address. Now, so that's just taking a picture. Uh, I'll put links to a website giving descriptions about this a little more detail. And uh, if I try to copy pictures over using GPhoto2 with this camera, it never works. So I always have to hook up through USB uh, to get the pictures off. But uh, let's go ahead and just quickly look at the device a little bit. So I can nmap 192.168.1.1 and hit enter, and Nmap will do its regular scan, which scans a majority of ports. It, Nmap by default does not scan all ports, it just scans ports of interest. And it will usually find on this camera with the basic scan, port 80. We'll see how long this takes. There we go, port 80, which we know is a web server. And I can go to that in my web browser and what it shows is a few text boxes saying parameters and there's funky little symbols inside those. It's useless. Really, if I was to design this device, which is probably running Linux, if I knew how to get a root shell on it, I'd probably be able to do a lot more with it. I would have set it up so that you don't need the app. You just hook to the device, try to go to any web page and have it redirect you to the camera because you're not connected to the internet anyway and have the full interface right there in your web browser. So you wouldn't have to install anything and you're good on any device that has a web browser, desktop, laptop, tablet, phone, regardless of operating system. That's how I would have done it. Would have been a lot more efficient. Um, unfortunately, even though it's it's running as a web access, a Wi-Fi access point and it has a web server on it, they did not go that route. So they have all the software there without the functionality. Now, if I run Nmap again, let me go ahead and uh, make this full screen, clear it up and say port 15740. I can scan that one port, which it doesn't scan in its regular um, scan. And you can see that that port is open if it ever finishes, if the camera ever replies. Anyway, that port will be open. There we go, open, it says unknown, although Googling it, this seems like a standard port that's used for PTP IP. So that's actually the port that um, gphoto2 is connecting to from my understanding so that's it just a quick little look at the camera I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to say about it in this tutorial again next week we'll probably look at um, doing the 3d interface for the sphere so that you can view it on your phone or desktop uh, tablet or laptop 
without having to use their web interface and you can not worry that 10, 20 years from now, all the photos you take with it are useless because you open up in a regular viewer, they're all just stretched out spheres that uh, aren't very clear. You want to view them as spheres because that's spheres because that's how you took them. And then the week after that, or that might be two weeks. Next week, I might go over the uh, web interface I made for my phone, the front end for what we just did, uh, and also talk about another script that we can use. So anyway. Thank you for watching. I uh, hope this video made sense. If you're not too f familiar with the camera, I hope I explained what it is properly and that you understand. Again, uh, even though I'm not thrilled with this camera and you're probably wondering, why are you doing a tutorial on this camera if you don't like it? Again, if it ever gets to about $100, this camera would be worth it. It is a fun little device. It's just could have been done better and could have better quality. But again, we're using G Photo 2 to connect to a Wi-Fi camera here or a camera with Wi-Fi enabled, um, which is, this is the only camera I have that does that. So, you know, if you have another camera, again, like last week I used the Canon T3i, maybe you have one of the newer cam cam Canon cameras that have Wi-Fi built in, and uh, the process should be similar, my assumptions. Again, I don't have one of those cameras. So, just a learning process, and uh, I hope you are enjoying this. Even if you don't have the camera, you learned something. As always, please visit my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K. There should be a link in the description. And as always, I hope that you have a great day. Okay, this is an introduction to filmsbychris.com. I'm Chris, that's Chris the K. That's me right there. My daughter Ember, and my wife Jennifer. We pretty much live in the swamps of Florida. I'm a firefighter by day, as well as by night. We work long hours. But that's not why you're here. You're here about the videos I put up on YouTube. These videos are mainly about computers and programming, which means most of my videos look something like this. And if that's what you're interested in, great. If not, that's all right. I do videos on other topics too, such as video editing, special effects, photo editing, 3D design, and music creation. If you are one of my viewers and you enjoy my videos, my Patreon page is a place where you can go to help support my videos. So I ask that you take the time to go to my Patreon page and look at the different levels of rewards you can receive for different levels of backing. There should be a link in the description of this video if you are watching it on YouTube. Otherwise, you can visit patreon.com forward slash metalx1000. And I thank you for your time and your support. Have a great day.